Um, the session is about how um, what the evidence that we have and how we can use evidence about factors that determine good and poor health, what we call the determinants of health, um, to talk about how we distribute health care dollars. So that's um, as, as public health dollars become tighter and uh, demands on our health system grow, uh, we are increasingly called upon to make decisions about uh, where, how the money will be distributed. Um, these issues around the distribution of healthcare dollars have been in the news a lot like, lately and about um, what information we take into account in deciding where to grow services and where to pull back. So, um, there I am. This is uh, myself, Karen Fish. Uh, and I am a Knowledge Translation Specialist with the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health. So just to give you some of the, or review some of the technical stuff, the uh, Adobe Connect link is there. If you're not on, that's probably, I mean, if you're on, you've probably found that somewhere. Uh, just to remind you to mute the speaker on your computer. Uh, that, that will reduce background noise for us and just use your telephones. So the telephone number and code are there. And as Anna mentioned earlier, um, we will open the lines for people to speak uh, later in the hour. And if you press uh, pound six to unmute your personal line. And there's Anna McNeil, our communications officer. Her uh, email address, and she's also put it in the chat box. If you ha are having difficulties, please get in touch with her. Okay. So uh, just a few words about, um, this is really about the accreditation process for physicians and residents in public health. Um, the series was designed to, to build on public health practice competencies for physicians and residents, and it's been approved for accreditation by McGill University up to 6.5 credits. So to get those credits, you have to be registered for the webinar, and also um, you have to uh, write your name in the chat box uh, to let us know that you're here. So those are two important things for you to do it if you're looking for the accreditation is to register on our website and it's on the uh, PHPC website and it's still open for registration and then the other is to put your name in the chat box here please. Uh, we're recording the webinar so people can view this webinar at a later date and then apply individually to McGill for accreditation. So let's find out who's with us today. If you could uh, just, uh, Anna's about to move over a poll here, just let us know uh, where in this list you fall. And um, if, it's, if it's other, if you could just write something into the chat box maybe about uh, your area of work. So just to say a brief word about uh, the six national collaborating centers for determinants of health, each of us are uh, charged with sharing knowledge and evidence to improve an area of public health practice. And um, my national collaborating center, the one I work with, is on the far on the east coast in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and we work in the area of the determinants of health, so we are helping public health uh, enrich and explore and expand its work in areas in the non-medical areas that affect health. So I have, there are two very passionate uh, public health advocates with us today. Oh. Um, 
Andrea Long uh, is a, a research and policy analyst with the Public Health Agency of Canada and author of a study looking at the um, how, how healthcare service usage spreads across the socioeconomic spectrum in Canada, and she will speak to you about that in a bit. And our second speaker is Neil Smith. And Neil is at the University of British Columbia and, and an adjunct with the University of Alberta School of Public Health, and he has a deep understanding of public policy process and where the leverage points are for making some of these decisions that I talked about earlier. So welcome, um, Andrea and Neil, and thank you. And uh, this is uh, the conflict of interest statement that both our speakers have uh, declared. So I guess at this point, Andrea, I will turn the telephone over to you. I had a, yeah. Uh, Andrea will speak first. I'll talk a little bit about our um, the research that we've been doing at the NCCDH or this knowledge synthesis, and then Neil will speak about his work. So first to you, Andrea. Thanks, Karen. Uh, can everybody hear me, I hope? Or could somebody let me know you can indeed hear me? Hi. Sorry, it's Anna. I'm just going to jump in here. I think we had a little slip up when setting up the webinar, so I'm just going to try and click something here to try and let more people join the call. I just want, okay. Sorry, I just wanted to warn you there in case something happened, but I think we're okay to proceed. Sorry about that. Continue. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So uh, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for having me here today to talk about um, this report. Uh, and I only have a short period, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, uh, Karen noted at the beginning that the important public policy questions that are motivating our conversation today are about how we allocate the public dollars we have available to invest in health and well-being of Canadians. So the report that I'm um, going to provide you with a brief overview of it today um, talks about some important new data that informs that discussion about um, allocation of public dollars. Um, and specifically, it does that because it provides the first national level estimate of how much socioeconomic health inequalities are costing the Canadian healthcare system. Uh, so, um, Understanding the healthcare costs of socioeconomic health inequalities is important um, because people with lower levels of income or education or, or other dimensions of socioeconomic status tend to be less healthy. We all know that, I'm sure, from public health and health research in Canada and internationally. And because um, people with lower socioeconomic status are generally less healthy, they also tend to need and use more health care services. So in that way, these socioeconomic health inequalities are associated with increased health care costs. To the extent, though, that those inequalities in health can be avoided or mitigated at least by the decisions we're making as a society about public policy and program investments, um, at least some of those additional costs could be avoidable. So that's the question that we wanted to get at uh, in our report, is trying to quantify how much those socioeconomic costs the healthcare system so we could get a sense of what, what of those costs might be potentially avoidable. So just two quick notes um, on the report before uh, we get into the discussion. Um, first, I just wanted to flag that it focuses on um, differences in health status and healthcare service use by people in um, different income groups. So we're using income as a proxy for socioeconomic status here, largely because in Canada we have more data on income and health than we do on other dimensions of socioeconomic status like education or occupation. Um, and secondly, I just did want to draw your attention to the fact that although this report focuses on costs in the healthcare system, um, or what we also call direct costs, um, socioeconomic health inequalities clearly also have other types of costs as well that are important. Indirect costs around decreased productivity because of illness or premature death, or intangible costs, uh, which are about the decreased well-being or decreased health-related quality of life as a result of illness. 
So although we don't look at those in this report, I just did want to underscore that as we do more work in this area, I hope in the future um, that those are important dimensions to look at as well. So how we approached answering that question that we posed in our report um, is by um, beginning with the hypothetical scenario that healthcare costs could be reduced if all Canadians had the same healthcare use and cost patterns as those in the highest income group. Um, so those in, the, in that top income group or top income quintile um, are used as the comparator in this research because it's those people that generally have the best health, they're the most healthy, um, and then they need and use generally um, fewer healthcare services leading to lower costs. So then based on that hypothetical scenario, the cost of socioeconomic health inequalities was calculated by looking at the average health expenditures of the bottom four quintiles, the bottom 80% of the population, compared to the average expenditures of the highest income quintile. And then, quintile. And then by summing up those differences, we ended up with an estimate um, of the cost of health, socioeconomic health inequalities to the healthcare system. So that's a little much to sort of say, uh, say in words. So to try and illustrate that graphically, um, the uh, portions of the healthcare costs for each quintile in this graph that are above the horizontal line were summed up to arrive at that estimate of the direct economic burden or the cost of socioeconomic health inequalities to the healthcare system. So what this graph shows us is that socioeconomic health inequalities cost at least $6.2 billion annually in Canada, uh, and that amount represents over 14% of total annual cost, oh, sorry, expenditures um, on the healthcare services that we look at in this report. And those healthcare services are acute care, inpatient hospitalizations, prescription medications, and physician consultations. So also in the year for which the data in this report were collected, that $6.2 billion um, direct economic burden um, actually exceeded the total public sector health expenditures in six individual provinces, so in PEI in Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and also for this, the expenditures for the three territories combined. So moving on to um, some further results, um, this little pie chart just illustrates the distribution of those um, costs of socioeconomic health inequalities across income quintiles. Um, so I think two things stand out in this graph. First of all, the costs are distributed across all income groups. We do see that there are increased costs compared to the highest uh, income quintile um, in each, each lower quintile. But I think the other thing that stands out even more is that quintile one, the lowest 20%, uh, the lowest income 20% of the population accounts for 60% of the total direct economic burden. So of that 6.2 billion, 3.7 billion are resting with the lowest income 20% of Canadians. So the report also confirms that um, the lowest income 20% of Canadians, that quintile one group, um, also generally has the highest age standardized health care costs, probably not coming as a big surprise to many people on the phone today. Um, and conversely, the highest income 20% of the population, quintile five, tends to incur the lowest costs. So in effect, we're sort of reconfirming that there is the gradient in health care costs. That's consistent with other um, Canadian research that has identified a relationship between socioeconomic status and health care utilization um, in Canada and elsewhere. Um, I, though we don't have this data in the presentation today, I did also just want to flag that, interestingly, the unequal distribution of health care costs generally is more pronounced at the bottom than the top. So the gap between low and middle income Canadians is bigger than the gap between middle and high income Canadians. The lowest income Canadians incur about 37% more costs than middle income Canadians, so that's sort of comparing quintile one to three but there isn't any statistically significant difference between total costs between quintile three and quintile five, so between the middle and the top. So um, just to wrap up today, I wanted to talk a little bit about why this research is important. Um, so first of all, as noted at the beginning um, of the presentation, um, the report does provide the first 
uh, national level, level estimate of the cost of socioeconomic health inequalities to the healthcare system um, in Canada. We haven't had a national level estimate previously. Uh, and that's important, um, as Karen alluded to earlier, um, given the conversations we're presently having about the adequacy of healthcare transfers and how we spend that money versus other federal funding commitments on things that affect the social determinants of health, housing, infrastructure, poverty reduction. There are quite a number that are um, federal priorities right now and, of course, priorities of provincial and territorial governments as well. The research also confirms that Socioeconomic health inequalities do impose a quite significant cost burden on Canadian society through higher health care expenditures. And also that given that the lowest income Canadians have a disproportionate share of that burden, it suggests that improving the health of that group could have a significant impact on the health care costs that we're seeing in this country. So again, there are important health policy considerations there that could help guide the balance of expenditures between prevention and treatment uh, and investments in other social supports that could facilitate healthy lifestyles. Uh, so related to that previous point, um, the report also underscores the potential economic benefit of acting to reduce health inequalities, and I think importantly here, starts to put a price tag on failing to act to reduce those inequalities. So certainly we know that some people aren't entirely comfortable with the idea of, of using economic rationale for population health promotion, feeling that we need to actually put a price tag on those things. Um, but, you know, minimally I think this kind of data does serve as a good complement to other types of arguments um, and other types of evidence that um, point to the importance of creating conditions in which everyone can enjoy as good health as possible. Um, I did also just want to quickly flag for folks in the audience that are uh, interested in research methods that um, this project tested the feasibility of a bottom-up approach to economic burden studies. Um, so by using individual level data, the bottom-up approach allows for assessment of the relationship between health costs and individual level characteristics, like income level, and that's essential for um, analyses of socioeconomic health inequalities. So the kind of top-down approach that's used in a lot of other burden studies doesn't permit that. And then finally, um, just in general, um, as I think we'll hear from others today too, we're just trying to help fill that knowledge gap. We just don't know a lot about the economic, economic impact of health inequalities, so we wanted to begin to address that. So really briefly, I just did want to draw your attention to a few points about the data in the report and some limitations. Um, I did already flag that it's national level data, but just to note that we did compile um, provincial and territorial data, and it is available in separate data tables. Um, and as I also implied earlier, we're only able to look in this report at healthcare services where individual level cost data are available at the national level, and that is for acute care inpatient hospitalization, prescription medication, and physician consultation. So that's about one quarter of all healthcare expenditures. So this analysis is a starting point at best. It's a partial analysis, but that's where we have the data right now. Um, excluding other costs clearly is going to affect the calculation of the burden, uh, and we're hopeful that maybe if we're able to get better data in the future, we could expand that calculation. We also did have to exclude some age and population groups. Um, a few of them are noted there. Um, and then finally, just from the standpoint of understanding what we can and can't say based on this data, it's important to note that the kind of data we use in the report doesn't permit us to um, draw any inferences about causal relationships between income and health. Um, it's a single point in time data, so we can't say whether um, people's health is shaped by their income level or socioeconomic status, or whether the opposite is true, or whether perhaps both are true to an extent. We can't use the data for that. Um, we also can't look at modeling the impact of other risk factors. Data is at the aggregate level, so we can't isolate things like geographic isolation or health behaviors and risk factors that clearly are also going to influence people's um, use, and, uh, use of healthcare services and associated costs. Um, and finally, the report also doesn't allow us to assess sort of any lifetime cost differences um, between socioeconomic status groups. So lower, in Cana lower income Canadians may cost more um, in the short term in that um, they tend to use more health care services, but unfortunately they also tend to live lower, shorter lives on average. So whether or not those patterns, how those patterns bear out over a lifetime to impact cost differences, we're not able to say at this point. 
Um, so just um, to wrap up then, um, if people are interested in getting a copy of the report or the supporting technical report from Statistics Canada, which talks in more detail about the data and the methods, um, you can get them from the Public Health Agency of Canada website or feel free to contact me directly and I'd be happy to send it out. And then also just to flag again, there are the provincial territorial data as well. So thanks very much and uh, Karen, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. So um, I am advancing to slide 19. Um, and this is uh, an image of the report that we published. Uh, we were told in our 2014 environmental scan that people wanted to know more about the economics of um, investing in the social determinants of health. And so we set out um, to look at what kind of, the, what the literature was saying and who was doing research that could actually put an economic cost. And, and um, Andrea's work surfaced very quickly. And in fact, our two reports were published within, I don't know, maybe three days of each other. Uh, so we were kind of waiting on each other th uh, for that one. Um, so we've looked at in our report, and some of what I'll talk about briefly today is just an overview of our health system spending because it, we, you need that context to understand um, the, the issues that we're talking about. So that would be what, what's driving um, health care costs. And then we looked at what are some of the, who's finding the, who's discovered some of those economic arguments for moving dollars upstream. And I just wanted to note that we did decide to limit our discussion to actually shifting dollars within the healthcare system. As uh, Andrea said, uh, money that could help uh, reduce this economic, socioeconomic burden could come from transportation and education and social services. But it was our feeling that the healthcare sector also uh, could look at how dollars are distributed uh, within that sector itself and uh, perhaps could lead in some of those ways. So just um, many of you know this, but I just wanted to review that um, uh, some of those upstream investments are things like providing adequate income and meaningful work, uh, greater access to quality education, um, more social economic inclusion, uh, decent housing, and healthy food, and the ways in which the healthcare sector now um, does those things is um, a, a certain percentage at, through public health work, which is uh, my organization's main area of interest, and um, and public health staff work intersectorally with all of those other sectors to try and improve the living conditions of people who uh, are suffering the health consequences of uh, the lack of all of those things that I mentioned. So that's what we refer to as upstream work. And you probably are very familiar that physicians are also within the acute care system and primary care system are also talking about taking more of an upstream approach to their work. So let's just take a look at, um, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> the total expenditures are as a percentage of GDP. Um, that as you can see this graph, which is um, from IHI, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, um, shows that there has been this 7% growth since 1975. So for climbing from, in 1975, from 77% of GDP up to a high of uh, close to 12% um, in, I guess that looks like 2007. And there has been an evening off in uh, healthcare expenditure as a percentage of GDP. And this is partly explained by declining economic growth and also uh, government restraint, which is happening in all sectors. So the next slide, which is slide, I'm not sure if I can see the number there, um, just shows that at the provincial level, the level of spending, I guess, becomes more 
um, acute. This data does not represent uh, First Nations and Inuit health data, um, which is by and large a federal responsibility. So at the provincial level, though, um, uh, there's a, you can see that provinces are spending 45, 37, 42 percent of their total government spending on health. The average is 38 percent. And uh, the projections from people like uh, David Dodge and Richard Dion is that at current uh, increasing levels or percentage increases, that by 2013 health care expenditures could consume 80% of provincial bu uh, budgets if we continue the way that we're continuing. So the next slide. Um, yeah, is also just shows uh, that um, spending Canadian, both public and private sectors, this is also from CAIHI, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, 2015, um, that in 2015, healthcare expenditures, private and public, were $219 billion. So it's interesting, Andrea, saying that the cost of inequality is being calculated at six point. Two billion. Those, those are not exactly comparable numbers because I think that 219 represents a larger catchment of health expenditures. But um, nonetheless, 6.2 billion would be a significant savings here. And um, uh, that the um, cost per person is 6,000. And I think data from the OECD, which uh, I had meant to include in here earlier, shows that that number was in the low 4,000s in 1975, and that we do not rank particularly well on the world stage, at least among the um, OECD countries. Our, our health outputs uh, are not commensurate with the amount of money that we spend per person on health. And the US data is quite startling in, in that area. Uh, that just this slide also from Kaihai, the data shows that the increases are in hospital care, in drugs, and in physicians. 0.9% uh, for hospitals, 0.7% for drugs, and 2.2% for physicians. Um, also, just to note that the vast majority of healthcare dollars go to the treatment of. Uh, chronic illnesses that are very linked to the determinants of health um, and, um, and the inequalities of health, areas like uh, cardiovascular disease and neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, so just also to put into context, uh, public health receives, as a national average, about 5% of the health care dollars. But uh, most of that money goes to areas like infectious disease, chronic disease prevention. So only a small percentage of that is being used directly to look at improving the social determinants of health. So I just want to quickly look at some of the drivers, uh, why people are concerned about our growing health care costs. This on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, we're in for a quite dramatic increase in the percentage of the population that is over 65 years of age. And then on the right-hand side um, is an illustration showing that people uh, over the ages of 65, it really increases over the age of 80, uh, become much uh, higher cost, cost factors in the healthcare system. So that coupling of that people tend to use the health care dollars more as they age and that our population is aging is a little bit of a, a storm. Um, another driver on our system is, uh, this is the next slide, is that while the diagram itself illustrates an increase in chronic disease, we also are building our ability to treat those things at an acute level. So we have this cost, uh, it's pushing up costs to not only have those higher levels of disease, but also we can treat them, and we do. 
Um, and then uh, the third um, driver, and um, I think Neil will speak a little bit more, is that this growing income gap. And um, as you can see, the top earners are becoming much wealthier, uh, whereas there's a great deal of um, stagnation in the average and lower income levels. And when you think of this data in terms of who is uh, costing because, they, because they're ill, uh, the healthcare system, who's costing the most, it is those people, and as Andrea pointed out, most prominently in the lowest uh, 20%. So, uh, oh, the final one is just it speaks to where will our money come from to address or to meet these challenges of uh, the pressures on the healthcare system. And one of the things you can see the black line is showing where our economic um, level of economic activity is versus the forecasts, which have been going down annually, but our forecasts are still. Uh, much more uh, positive than the actual rate of economic growth. So we're in a period of declining economic growth, which means fewer, lower government revenues uh, total. So making the uh, need to, to think long and hard about how we distribute those dollars even more important. So I will now pass the presentation over to Neil. Thank you very much, Karen. And again, uh, somebody do let me know if they're not uh, if they're not hearing me. But I'll uh, I'll proceed on the assumption that you are. And the uh, the presentation that I am going to um, be covering off this morning is about uh, work in priority setting and resource allocation in the uh, healthcare system and kind of the possibilities of using that. Uh, using evidence from that literature to, to assist in uh, reallocating towards uh, social determinants of health. So this is uh, slide 30, if people are wanting to kind of orient themselves to where we are. And we're starting from the premise that I think is uh, pretty well backed up, that, uh, that health is perhaps sometimes best advanced at the population level by investing in the social determinants. Uh, Karen called that upstream action in her presentation. Uh, social determinants, meaning economic and social conditions that influence the health of individuals, communities, and jurisdictions as a whole, quantity and quality of uh, resources that the society makes available, things like uh, childhood development, income, food security, housing, employment, and the uh, health and social services that are available as well. So this just kind of illustrates, uh, exhaust, not exhaustive, but illustrates some of the, uh, the social determinants that we are talking about, those kinds of things like food security, like work and unemployment, like adequate and affordable housing. There's a lot of uh, work in the policy literature that has identified the, uh, the challenges and barriers to making um, interest in and action on social determinants of policy priority. And some of those factors are things like the long time horizons that are often needed to, to make a difference when you're trying to impact uh, the education system or, or employment over the longer term. And it means those results are kind of out of sync with what uh, the political cycles and electoral cycles exist and the, the desire that, that political leaders have to get action and results in, in three to four year cycles so that they can, uh, can uh, take credit for them on the, on the campaign trail. A second uh, known barrier is kind of the, uh, the philosophical dominance of, of biomedical and individualist philosophies and the interests which benefit from them. So the view that uh, poverty is, is an individual responsibility and problem rather than a social condition or the idea that uh, you know, the, the best way to address health problems is to find the right pill for, for every uh, everything that comes along. Um, moving along to the next slide, some of the other challenges are just about uh, coordinating and, and collaborating within and across uh, governments and, and civil society organizations. There's a 
perception that uh, population health promotion or, or social determinant of health initiatives may lack evidence about their effectiveness, and they might be, uh, be, be risky to take on, and just the general popular momentum that, that medical care spending enjoys in, in the cultural psyche of Canadians, the idea that you know, Medicare is a defining achievement, it's something that sets us apart from the United States and that there are political risks involved in anything that might be tinkering with a, with a system that's highly valued by Canadians. So I just wanted to uh, touch next on the next slide with uh, some interesting work that's come out of Australia which uh, reinforces what I've, what I've just been saying and that's that there are a number of, uh, of challenges to getting social determinants of health on the agenda and this is based on interviews with uh, decision makers and policy makers and the authors there identify kind of six big barriers, uh, half of them in sort of the structural dimensions of the issue and the other half in questions about values and, and worldviews and the language that we use. So um, some of the barriers are who's got the authority to act and who gets the credit. Um, to just, so just to quote from that study, impacts are sort of medium to long term with social determinants of health. So it's often not clear where credit will lie for them. Particular ministers or governments can't identify, we got this outcome for what it is that we did. Um, government is organized in departments and they operate as silos and there are those challenges with getting coordination and connection and uh, collaboration across them. And the third point, uh, the political problem of electoral incentives. What incentives do the politicians have to respond to evidence about the social determinants of health? So again. To quote the Australian study, um, one of the respondents there said, you know, politicians don't care if the community is not pushing them. It doesn't matter how strong the argument is. If it's given to a politician in the closed confines of the room, then they go outside and people are complaining about the level of taxes. That's what they're going to be listening to. On the values and worldview side, the, the, there are challenges with how problems are defined and what solutions are offered and whether advocates are proposing solutions that are consistent with the policy instruments that particular governments have available to them to uh, attempt to, uh, to act. Um, the fifth challenge is that uh, policy making is not a linear and rational process. It's complex, it's messy, it's uh, opportunity driven, iterative, responsive to events and that's just the reality of the, uh, of the political process. And the last point uh, that they talked about was that the what's the perceived value of acting on the social determinants of health. And the main argument is that it's uh, a moral choice. It's a value choice. It's about things that we think are important. And the respondents here said that that should be clear. You shouldn't hide that. You shouldn't obfuscate it. You're asking people to make a moral decision about allocation of resources when you ask them to act on social determinants and act on reducing health inequalities. Um, so what I want to do in the presentation is kind of uh, see what we can draw from priority setting literature and experience that, that might be useful in facilitating a shift of attention and resources towards the social determinants of health. So just to, uh, to define quickly, priority setting is a process of decision making about the allocation of resources between, uh, between competing claims. Uh, it can occur at different levels and typically that's described as the, uh, the micro level or bedside or clinical rationing, which is things like if you have a limited, uh, limited supply of donor organs, uh, which patients are going to get them. Uh, you can do priority setting at the MISO level, which is within organizations about how they allocate their own, their own internal budgets, so such as if you have new funds to invest. Um, will they go into diagnostic imaging or will you put them instead towards uh, increases of occupational therapy services? And at the macro level is about resource allocation across uh, organizations or across departments and portfolios. So should you take bud money from the Department of Health budget and use it to increase uh, income support payments? Most of the literature uh, is in the first two of those, those three categories, so I'll try as, kind of, kind of as best I can to uh, extrapolate it to the, uh, to the latter. So moving on to slide 37, for um, today's purposes, I'm going to group the, the potential approaches to enable reallocation into two really kind of broad categories of breaking down silos and, and bridging silos. So if we think of collaboration between organizations as kind of working on a continuum, starting from consulting each other, 
sharing information, coordinating activities, co-designing services, sharing resources, entering into some kind of formal agreement or formal merger of organizations. Bridging silo approaches would be kind of towards the, uh, the left-hand end of that spectrum, and, and breaking down the silos happens at the, uh, at the right-hand end of that, uh, that continuum. So breaking silos, first of all, some kinds of institutional arrangements can make it possible for, for those kinds of reallocation decisions to occur. And one of the big examples in Canada was the effort to create uh, regional health authorities that happened through the uh, through health care reforms in the, uh, the 1990s. The idea was bringing together what had used to be independent hospital boards and, and continuing care organizations and public health organizations into one body would give you the opportunity to, to reallocate resources between those areas towards more public health and population health services. There are some examples of attempts to, to go even more broad than that, such as a very short-lived experiment in Prince Edward Island with Health and Social Services Board, as something that they have a, something a bit similar to in, uh, in Northern Ireland. In general, the idea is that the more discrete bodies you've got, the more special purpose boards that exist, the more protected envelopes there are, the harder it is to, to make dollars flow across those, those silos. Uh, what the evidence tells us is that regionalization has yet to really prove its ability to, to allow reallocation to social determinants of health. Uh, importantly, you know, drugs and physician services are outside the, the purview, so that's big chunks of money that were never available for, for reallocation by the, uh, the health authorities, which are in, in nine of the ten, ten provinces. And over time, uh, sort of the envisioned mandate of the regions to increase uh, action on determinants of health has kind of been pushed aside in favor of more individualist uh, and, and lifestyle-based health promotion. In BC, we saw some initial increases within RHAs to, to public health resources, and that's kind of been scaled back subsequently, potentially suggesting that, that there's, there's, a, there's reallocation back towards uh, acute care purposes. What the priority setting literature says, there's a lot of uh, experience in Canada and elsewhere at, at the regional level, and it suggests that under certain conditions, uh, formal processes for allocating resources can allow selection of a population health priorities and, and social determinants of health priorities. Um, to summarize some of the kind of the main messages from that literature, those, those processes have an explicit ethical by basis. So it's, clearly stated that the decisions that you're making in priority setting are not simply technical ones about what's most efficient, but they are value choices about what, what is important and what should be supported. Um, a second point is the use of multi-criteria decision techniques, so the decisions don't boil down to simply which service is going to have the greatest impact on quality-adjusted life years, but to bring in a bunch of additional tech the criteria to consider, such as equity impacts, for instance, and ensure that those are weighted within the, the decision process and have some of those criteria as ones that clearly reflect the, the values and, and, and beliefs of, of public health and social determinants of health. Structured cases for presenting evidence, so all of the, uh, all of the options are, are considered on the same basis, having open dialogue and decisions and having public and, and staff engagement and participation through that. And then processes that, that are looking for gains at the margins, meaning essentially that the choices aren't between programs that are effective and programs that are ineffective, but the choices are often between two different programs which are both effective, and the decisions are about can you get more benefit by, by reallocating from, from one of those to, to, to a different one. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip the next slide, but it's simply uh, a summary of work that we've done that says what does a, a successful and effective priority setting and resource allocation process encompass, and there's um, about 19 uh, elements to that that we'd identified. Uh, that's in social science and medicine last year. If you want to, to follow that, I won't, I won't go into that to, today. I'll move to um, the idea of bridging silos. Um, it's unlikely, I'd suggest, that at anything higher than the regional level that you're going to be merging uh, different departments, as the, as the Australian data suggests. The department kind of seems to be the natural organization form of, of governments, and that's going to stay 
stay that way for for a while. So we need to look at how we can bridge the silos and have resource allocation and collaborative processes that can occur across the uh, the agency boundaries. And there are a few examples of those in the literature, uh, interministerial or interdepartmental uh, committees, such as uh, Healthy Child Manitoba, which was uh, a cabinet uh, committee created in that province to, to coordinate uh, different ministers and have them engaging together and work to support a process that, uh, that funded uh, local community-based coalitions to, to look at healthy child development issues. Or Act Now BC, which uh, was a provincial initiative in, in this province here on the West Coast prior to the, uh, the 2010 Winter Olympics, an interdepartmental committee of uh, um, assist, uh, deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers who worked together to try and integrate uh, health goals and targets into department service plans. It benefited from having an incentive fund where it was actually stated that there were certain parts of the health care budget that would be allocated to initiatives that were created by and led by other departments. So that helps to, to get the buy-in. But uh, Act Now BC tended to aim at typical health promotion, health education kinds of things. And it wasn't, for instance, prepared to challenge departmental policies in, in other non-health areas that might actually have been damaging to or, or detrimental to, to health and equity. Uh, another a couple of examples of mechanisms is, is the work in health and all policies coming out of, uh, of Europe originally around 2006 and, and implemented and extensively written about in, in a South Australian context. And the, uh, the collective impact model from, from the United States uh, originating kind of around uh, five or six years ago. An example of that is, is again here in BC with the Child and Youth Mental Health and, and Substance Use Collaborative, which is about kind of tackling that kind of really so complex social problem by building relationships, trying to change the way people and organizations work together, working through things like a common agenda, shared measurements, mutually reinforcing activity, continuous communication. So what are the prospects for, for scaling up the lessons of priority setting research to that, that larger provincial cabinet ministerial level? Um, that's really tentative here, I'm going to say. We don't have a, a lot of research that's tried to, uh, to look at that area. A couple of the things that I might suggest is having uh, support for credible institutions of health technology assessment, such as the, uh, the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health to kind of try to help us determine the benefit of, of new medical technologies and health technologies before they get into wide, uh, widespread use and ideally to, to, to reconsider technologies already in use as, as times change. Um, another possible tool is, is the use of health impacts assessments as kind of a standardized way of producing evidence for policy decisions where everything is considered with that health lens and the impacts on health and on determinants of health are are identified so that they can be considered. And uh, of course, the idea that, that public health professionals and, and public health organizations need to be, uh, be advocates for change. And I'd just like to kind of wrap it up by kind of saying, what's the, the big picture? Um, a colleague and I, in, in a book chapter that was published last year, looked at possible directions in, in the evolution or in the trajectory of Canada's health system over the next 20, 25 years or so. And we identified uh, what we thought were you know, five possibilities of the way things could evolve um, summarized here. There is a possibility that we could stay fairly similar to the status quo, which means that decisions about health policy are primarily led and influenced by finance ministries and, and the, the, the holding of the purse in Treasury departments and a continued privileging of, of the inter interests of per provincial medical associations in, in the shaping of health policy. We might see kind of an enhanced status quo or a status quo plus a second scenario, which really means maybe a bit more targeted health spending programs for specific groups like the, uh, the elderly, possibly mental health, things like that. A third scenario we kind of talked about was egalitarianism, or the idea that they could have situations where governments come into office with strong political commitment to reducing inequities and inequalities. We can learn potentially from new institutional arrangements that might come out of uh, efforts to, to, to advance reconciliation with, with the First Nations. Uh, those kind of things probably depend upon uh, continuing economic prosperity in the country. 
A fourth scenario we envisioned was technology-driven with the, the rise and increasing influence of personalized or, or precision medicine uh, values suggesting that governments need to, to get out of the way of, of healthcare entrepreneurs and, and a strong shaping effect of, of globalization and international trades and then rules and regulations that, that exist in those kind of international uh, trade agreements. And the fifth scenario, uh, we call it the public health emergency, but it would be a situation where really government responses are driven by uh, adapting to, to global climate change. We seeing um, hardening of borders. We see um, increased efforts to, to manage uh, climate refugees, uh, to deal with uh, emerging uh, new disease vectors and increases in, in communicable diseases and things like that. Um, if we're living in the future in either of the last two scenarios, that probably means we're unlikely to see much focus on, on social determinants health, such as poverty reduction. Um, the egalitarian scenario offers us kind of the best prospects for advancing this agenda. And if we're going to have some kind of variation of the status quo, that means probably some kind of continuation of what we've got so far on reallocating social determinants of health, which is some degree of talk and not very much action. So I've got uh, a couple of uh, slides of references there, which you can uh, take a look at, and, and I can send you if you don't get a chance to get them out of the, the webinar presentation. And that is my contact information. So thanks very much, folks, for listening. And I think, uh, Karen, uh, this is where we go to uh, questions and discussion now. Yes, thanks very much, Neil. I, I appreciated that. It's an, that uh, the process of coming to those decisions is not an area of my expertise. So I, I, yeah, I appreciated your presentation. And so Anna will open up the lines for us now. Yes. Everybody? OK, sorry. So um, Joel, you had uh, put some questions forward. Um, and I sounds like the first one would be to Andrea. But I wondered if you wanted to uh, express it yourself I can, by p uh, doing pound six to unmute your line. there. But um, maybe I'll go ahead with the first one. So the, Joel's question was, um, so if these data, and I think that was referring to the FAC report, do not confirm the association as causal between income and uh, use of health color dollars, I guess, what other hypothesis should be considered to explain the association of income and health expenditures? So Andrea, would you like to respond to that? Oh, am I, has something gone wrong? Hello? I don't think, I'm not online. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Andrea. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I thought everybody was unmuted now. <laughs> um, anyway, I was just going to sort of briefly say um, that uh, just just this, because I'm saying the data in this report don't confirm a causal relationship, I'm certainly not saying that there isn't one. Um, so I mean, this particular single point in time data can't establish that. So what we would need is uh, something more longitudinal that allows us to look over time and, of course, we're then up against the sort of typical research standard of can we actually do a controlled, um, a controlled experiment that has a, um, a program group and a control group to actually look at differences. Now, whether or not that's feasible or even ethical in this context, certainly I think there are a lot of questions around that. Um, but I do see the potential for some opportunities for interesting research in that area with some of the conversations now about things like the um, guaranteed annual income pilot. Uh, if, um, probably you're familiar with the studies earlier in the 70s around that that did look at some of the outcomes of, the, um, of that type of program in health as well as other areas. So um, I think we have some potential to explore those questions through those kinds of policy experimentation options. 
Um, but I also want to say that um, I also don't, don't think we want to get sort of completely preoccupied with the question um, of evidence. I think we do have plenty of evidence around um, social determinants of health um, and a strong sense of associations in many areas, enough, I think, to at least motivate uh, moving from research to testing of interventions. So I think we're not going to get uh, a lot of broader data about pathways of influence and how those actually operate until we actually start implementing some programs that we can assess over time um, and look at impacts that way. Thanks. And um, uh, Joel asked a second uh, question. I guess, I guess, and you've, you've responded to that, I think, in your response, Andrea. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but how important is it to establish whether and how much income and other social determinants are causal? I, um, I think of poor health outcomes and higher costs. So I think you have responded to that one as well in your comments. And then um, uh, sure, well, yeah, that's fine. I'll, and I'll certainly I'll leave space for others to um, to respond uh, instead of saying more there. <laughs> uh, well, perhaps. And and then um, Joel had a further question, which was regarding Marmot's use of the phrase "causes of the causes." Do you think that we should be exploring the determinants of the maldistribution of determinants? So that almost sounds like this. Yeah, you know, the structural, <laughs> the political and economic systems and political leaders in neighboring and influential countries. So um, I, I, I wonder, Neil, if you might want to... Um, I can uh, do that's that. That's an interesting expression of the determinants of the maldistribution of determinants. That's right. That's right. I can, I can do a, a very quick answer to, to Joel's question, which is yes. I think that definitely there's, there's value in that because as he's suggesting, a lot of the things that we do know are determining health, like, like employment, for instance, is, is clearly affected by decisions that are being made by, you know, in many cases, large, large uh, global corporations which operate in, in a number of different places. And so we do need to take account of the fact that, that employment policy is going to be affected by those decisions that are made outside of our borders. Um, they're affected by the, the trade agreements that are negotiated between Canada and other countries. So again, those kind of factors ought to be, I'd, I'd agree with, with sort of the, the, the thrust of the question that kind of the way those, those determinants are distributed are affected by more than, than local or, or even Canadian national policy and we need to understand what those external, um, external forces and factors are so that we can, uh, can include them in understanding of policy uh, responses that might be, be viable and, 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 and feasible. Um, per, perhaps a question from me for both of you. It was a difficult decision to limit our work to what what could happen within healthcare dollars to look at more upstream preventative uh, programs. Do you, do you think there's value in or in that more isolated look as uh, in contrast, Neil, perhaps to the intersectoral uh, suggestions that you gave examples of interdepartmental. Um, I would say that there's uh, there's benefit to to both of those approaches. A lot of the uh, the actual priority setting work that's been done, as I suggest, tends to be reallocations within healthcare organizations. So there has been fairly limited actual research on, on ways that we can move um, dollars between the, the health sector as a whole and, and other areas. So a lot, of, a lot of our evidence is drawing from what happens within health systems. There certainly is, I think, a fair body of arguments that suggest uh, you know, that, that there's benefits that can be attained, and, and, and some of the work that you've presented is, is I think, suggesting that by, by more focus on um, public health kinds of factors and population health factors than continuing to necessarily increase uh, health technology spending or, or acute care spending. So I think there's, there's benefit in exploring both. I think there's more evidence, and, and it's easier in some ways to do it within the uh, the silo of the health system. But, but 
it should probably be also explored the, if, if there are options for for extending it, it across across uh, different uh, policy sectors. Thank you. And, and Andrea, I don't know if your work has led you to thinking about um, inside and outside the public health or this health sector in terms of um, looking at those uh, health inequalities. Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of our work is is driven by many of the things that Neil was pointing to around, you know, more integrated approaches to coordinating policy and the partnerships and collaborations that are needed to make that happen. And, um, you know, well, I I agree with Neil that I think there's merit to both, and I think you know it's great great for the health sector to query itself um, in terms of thinking about its organization and and possible um, shifts in prioritizing or. Um, you know, that kind of conversation. But I do also think, and, and kind of going to the point that Neil raised, that we have this sort of view in Canada of, of our um, uh, medical care system as sort of being quite sacro sacrosanct almost, right? Like we, um, and increased funding for health care is, is sort of presented as almost an unconditional good, um, you know, that of course that's a good thing to spend more money in that area. And I think where it's difficult to not extend the conversation to include other sectors is that, we have to recognize that you know increased spending in one area may mean less spending or decreased spending elsewhere. I'm not wanting to suggest it's always a zero-sum game, um, but there is something to be said for the fact that the overall envelope of health spending has to be viewed and um, against the overall envelope of spending elsewhere, including on the factors that help shape people's health, promote good health, and prevent ill health. Um, so I think the balance of expenditures overall, um, including where you know to whom uh, to whom those monies go within our population, um, are important conversations that have to cross the health um, and sort of social environmental sector boundaries. Thank you. So I I would just like to um, open up the opportunity if anybody wants to um, do the pound six and uh, ask a question verbally of, a, of the speakers. Just give you a couple of moments if anybody wants to comment or ask a question. Just leaving some time, Andrea, because it, yeah, <laughs> takes a while sometimes for the, so, um, so thank you. I, to either of you, to Neil or to Andrea, are there any last uh, comments you'd like to make? I think I've uh, said my piece. I don't know that I need to, to add anything more. I thank everybody for, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to attend and listen today. Yeah, I'll definitely echo that. Thanks for the opportunity to both the Public Health Physicians of Canada and to the NCCDH for um, inviting us. And uh, it's great to have a chance to actually engage with folks in the public health physician world. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. And thank you both. And, um, and for the opportunity that, that we have Yes, through the uh, Public Health Physicians of Canada to, to talk about these issues. So um, as Pema mentioned earlier, please put your names. Anybody who is uh, planning to apply for accreditation, please put your name in the chat box. And uh, this presentation with the voice, the audio, as well as the slides will be up on the Public Health Physicians of Canada website shortly. Um, Pema, is there anything you want to add? So thanks, everybody, and, um, and thank you to Andrea Long and Neil Smith for their presentations. Oh, oh uh, yeah, there was one last survey, but, but Anna's just pointing out to me, I guess for those of you who are, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, I know what you're saying. There's an evaluation survey? Okay. Yeah, there is an evaluation which will be sent out to everybody who's participated, and um, th these are the links uh, in English and French. Thanks for that, Anna.
So please let us know, uh, take the time to uh, give us some feedback. So thanks, everybody.